pray. Father, we thank you for these glorious truths of the gospel and the good news of the resurrection of your son. Help me, Lord, to proclaim these wonderful things that are beyond my ability and open up our hearts, Lord, so that we can perceive and see with spiritual eyes these powerful truths and may they transform us from the inside out. Speak, O Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. Well, friends, as I said, today we are kicking off a brand new sermon series called Rooted Together. And we're going to be taking a uh, short, relatively short journey through the book of Colossians. And just so, just so you know, one of the things that our leadership council at our church does is we, we pray and we discern what God is doing in our church. And we, and we listen to one another. We assess what is going on and ask for the Holy Spirit's direction. And in the midst of this last year of all of the challenges and the uh, isolation and potentially divisive things that have happened, we all agreed our number one goal for this year in getting through this pandemic is unity in the body of Christ, developing unity in the body of Christ. And so one of my commitments then is to listen to that counsel and to say, well, what can I do to make that discerned theme a reality in our body? And so I was praying, is there something that I can preach on that would help us be unified in and through Jesus Christ? And so that is why I'm preaching to you through this series on the book of Colossians. I believe it will help us be more deeply rooted together in Jesus. And that's my prayer for this series, that we will be more united and deeper in Christ so that we can face the challenges of living as the church today. So rooted together, uh, I'd like to, besides the great image that Angela provided for us with all the, the pool noodles, uh, I'd like to give you one more image uh, about rooted that I'd like to throw up on the screen for you. Uh, these are sequoia trees. You may be familiar with this, and many of you know that I love the national parks. We've, we've been to many different national parks. Sequoia National Park is probably my number one. It's probably my favorite. I rank it over everything else. And these trees are just magnificent. A picture cannot do it justice. Uh, some of these trees are over 300 feet in the air. And these are some of the oldest organisms, uh, living creatures in our world. Some of these trees are over 3,000 years old. I mean, that's incredible. That's like 1,000 B.C. You know, this is unbelievable. And you would expect that something so tall would need roots that go way, 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 way down. But that's the interesting thing about sequoias. Their roots are only about 6 to 12 feet deep, give or take. Isn't that interesting? Well, how then do they stay up? Well, they actually send out their roots, sometimes over 100 feet away from the tree. And they interlock with all those trees around them. All the trees you see on the screen, their roots are interconnected under the ground. And it's that connection of the roots that sustains these trees for thousands of years so that no matter what comes, no matter floods or heavy wind or sleet or rain or snow or fire or what happens, these trees stay standing because they have sent out their roots to connect with each other. And that's the picture of what we're going for in the body of Christ. To send out our roots into Christ and connect with each other so that we can face the challenges of living in this world. So rooted together. To do that, we're looking at Colossians. I invite you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. You can get out a Bible in front of you or you can pull it up on your phone. Uh, a little bit of context before we dive into the passage. Uh, Paul did not plant the church of Colossae. In fact, he has never met this group of people uh, because currently, as when he wrote this, he is in prison for the gospel. And a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, he planted this church. And he visits Paul in prison to give him a report on how things are going in the church. And Paul hears some good things. Things are going well. They have faith in Jesus. They love one another. But Paul also hears some concerning things. There's some false teaching going on. There's some new philosophy springing up in the church. And so the Apostle Paul is concerned enough for them that he writes them this letter because he fears if he doesn't that things in the community may unravel. And we'll be getting into more of that later in this series. But notice how opposite this is of often we, what we are tempted to do in our world. When competing ideas, when competing philosophies arise, our answer, our world's answer, is typically pluralism. 
You know, well, look, you believe Jesus is God, and you believe in all kinds of gods. You know, that's fine. Let's just be unified. Let's, let's be together. It doesn't matter what, what you believe what you be, and what you believe is different. That's okay. The world's answer to these types of things is pluralism. But the Apostle Paul is saying, no, no, that's a false unity. The answer is not just to accept what everybody is saying, but to actually drive our roots down deeper into the truth so that we can stay connected on what God says is true. That's why he says in verse 23, continue in your faith, established and firm. Do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Don't move. You will be tempted and pressed on every side, but stay firm. Stay grounded, stay planted, stay rooted. Stay rooted in the gospel. Well, what is this gospel that we are to be deeply rooted in? What is the soil, if you will, that we are to send our roots out collectively in so that we can stay firm and grounded? Well, that's the question I hope to tackle this morning. And if you were here last Sunday with us on Easter, gosh, what what a glorious day last week was, wasn't it? Wow, that was just fantastic. Um, And last week I talked about the simple gospel. Uh, and kind of the basics. So today is kind of an unattended part uh, two to that sermon. It's a deeper dive into what is this good news and what Jesus has done for us. And we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 23. And friends, we could spend a whole sermon series on just these 10 verses. These are some of the most incredible verses in the entire Bible. So I'm going to try to do the best that I can, but but hang with me and, and think about these truths with me because they are so powerful, and they give us a few different pictures of what the gospel is, of a few different ways of describing this most incredible event in the history of the world. And so we're going to look at those few, few pictures, and, and the first one that we're going to look at is this. Number one, Jesus rescued us. Jesus rescued us. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 13, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. So the first image that Paul gives us here is that of uh, spiritual warfare, that there is a battle going on. Uh, And perhaps you may not be familiar with that idea or that term, but uh, this is described all throughout the Bible that the universe that we live in is one of intense spiritual conflict. And we perhaps can't see it with our physical eyes, but we can experience and we see its effects all around us. It's kind of like the wind or like gravity. You can't see it with your eyes but you feel and you experience its effects. It's the same with the spiritual realm. We look at the world around us, all of the evil and sad injustices and divisions. We clearly can see the forces of evil uh, in our world and the effects that they have. And there is, there is a dark power, sometimes called Satan or the devil, who is at work in the world enslaving humans to evil desires. And the gospel, part of the gospel is that Jesus came to defeat these powers and rescue us from them. In fact, Paul will go on to say in Colossians 2.15 that Jesus has disarmed the powers and authorities. He's made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. In other words, because of the cross, sin has lost its power. Evil has lost its power over us. The accusations of the enemy are now false and we can now be liberated. And Paul describes this as a rescue mission from one domain to another domain, or from one kingdom to another kingdom. He says, he says he transfers us into the kingdom of his son. And that's a word also can mean transport. It's like we're being moved from one sphere where evil has power into another sphere, a total different reality altogether. Now, I recently told some of you that I've been trying to catch up on pop culture from the last, like, like from like 10 years ago. Uh, I, I finally I finished uh, all the Marvel movies, just so you know. That was my big pandemic accomplishment. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of that. And um, there's a, uh, one of the movies, Captain America, the first Avenger. Uh, there is a scene where uh, these allied soldiers are caught in a, a Nazi base, Hydra base. And Steve Rogers, Captain America... He wants to go save these soldiers, so he goes into their base, defeats all the guards because he's Captain America, and brings them back to uh, the home base where everyone uh, is there waiting and cheering their return. And that's the picture of what Jesus has done for us. He came from heaven to earth to infiltrate enemy territory 
and bring us out of the sphere of the devil, out of the power of evil, so that we can be brought back home into the kingdom where the Holy Spirit now has power and influence over our lives and not the enemy. He's brought us back home to the cheering of angels, back into his kingdom. So the present kingdom is Jesus' rule over his obedient people. And so sometimes the kingdom can be so vague. What is the kingdom of God? Well, there's many answers to that. Many people give many definitions. But I think we need to understand and we need to see the church as the center of the kingdom of God in the world. We are brought, we are brought out of the darkness of the world and into the light of the church. Friends, the church, it's the safe haven from the darkness of this world. It is the ark to carry us through the storm. It is the body we cannot live without. It is the mother from which we must nurse. It is the kingdom to which we belong to and fight for. It is the home base to which we have been transported to. It is the intertwining root system to support each other through life. And how much do you value the church? Oh, do we value it as much as God does? This is one of the most incredible things Jesus has done. He's rescued us out of darkness. He's brought us into the church, into his kingdom. Let's remember the value and celebrate what Jesus has done by rescuing us into his people. The second picture that uh, we get of the gospel in this text is that Jesus redeemed us. Jesus redeemed us. Now, the word redeemed can often become Christianese for us. We, we say redeemed or we sing redeemed. But we need to remember that it's a word that means liberation from slavery, usually by paying some type of ransom price. Paul says in verse 14, it's in Jesus in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And not only does it mean slavery, but this word for God's people would often recall the exodus. When God redeemed, when he brought his people out of Egypt, and brought him uh, into the promised land where they could be his people. And something we miss about both the Exodus and the gospel is that people, the people were set free for a new kind of relationship with God, a new covenant with God. You see, in the Exodus, the blood of the Passover lamb protected Israel from God's judgment, and then he delivered them across the Red Sea so that they could be his people. He gives them a covenant, the law, and he gives them instructions for setting up the tabernacle so that his presence could dwell with them and they would be liberated to be his people in this new land. So in the new covenant, this time in the gospel, we are in bondage to sin and to spiritual forces, enslaved to evil desires. And the price for our redemption was the incredibly high cost of the Son of God's life, where, it, where his blood now covers over us, saving us from the judgment of God, and releasing us into a new relationship where not the tabernacle, but by his spirit, we are indwelled to live in this new covenant where by the spirit we are indwelled and empowered to be God's holy people. So in both the Exodus and in the gospel, it's not freedom for freedom's sake. It's freedom for the, to be free to live for God and as God's people. We're liberated for life in Christ. We're redeemed for relationship. We are saved for service unto God. Jesus redeems us. The third picture we get in this passage is that Jesus rules the world. He rules the whole world. And this next section that we get to is one of the most magnificent sections about Jesus in the whole Bible. Most scholars believe that this is a hymn or an early hymn or poem about Christ. And in this picture, we see the, the overwhelming rule and power that are attributed to Jesus. Paul says, he is the, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. We could spend a whole sermon on just that line, but dwell with me a moment on this. It says, the Son is the image or the icon of the invisible God. Now, isn't that interesting? We know from the creation story, it says that God made male and female, humanity in the image of God, as God's icons, his representatives upon the earth. Now, what does it mean for humanity to be made in the image of God? People give 
different answers. Some people say, well, it's our ability to reason. Or it's the fact that we're relational. Or it's the fact that we have awareness, we have consciousness. No, all of these are good things. But I think we have to ask, why were we given these things? And the Bible tells us that God created us to surprisingly rule on God's behalf over all creation. That we were intended to be God's representatives, God's vice regents upon the earth, stewarding his creation unto perfect shalom and peace the way God intended it. But we know we failed. We failed. We rebelled. And so what did God do? God sent the true image, the true icon, his true representative who would not fail, who would not rebel, who would obey unto death, and he would become the rightful ruler over all creation. Isn't that amazing? The story that God is writing? He is the image of God. He is the true human bearing God's exact image, and that makes him the rightful ruler over all creation. Fully God, but fully man. The rightful king. And Paul calls him the firstborn. And now in both a Greco-Roman and Jewish household, the firstborn, this is not a a term that is somehow related to uh, chronological time, but it's a term related to status. That the firstborn had the highest status among the children. So this is the saying that Jesus is the highest status in over all creation. He is the preeminent one. Why? Verse 16. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Friends, that line is, should be, would have been so shocking to the people reading this. Paul is, it was a Jewish monotheist, believed in one God, And he is saying that the man from Nazareth that we ate with, a guy that looked just like one of us, that guy who was nailed to a cross, who almost nobody in history heard about, he is actually the creator God. The one who is behind this whole universe, he is the one who has created everything you see and the things you don't see. This is astonishing. This should blow our minds. I can't believe he's saying this. Paul says all of creation is in him and through him and for him. That means Jesus Christ is the source of all the life in creation. It's through him. That means through him all creation was made. And all of this, all of creation, it says it exists for him. That's the goal of this whole story, this whole thing, all of life. People wonder, what is this world progressing to? What is going to be the outcome of this story? What is the goal of this whole universe? Every knee bowing. Every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That is what this world is going to. That's why we're here. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the pre-existent one. The whole world is held together by his power. And it says in verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Let's break this down. It says he's the Lord of the church. Okay, we get that. He's king of the church. He's also the firstborn from among the dead. Now, this is a reference to the resurrection. He's the first one, as a human, to be raised to life after death. And and this means that just as Jesus is Lord, the true image, over the first creation, he is also the beginning of God's new creation, how God is redeeming all of his world. And this this scope of Jesus' lordship is absolutely incredible. Biblical scholar David Powell, he says this, The repeated reference to all things. Did you notice that? All things. And the all-encompassing description in heaven and earth, visible and visible, as well as the rhetorically powerful list in verse 16, the thrones, the dominions, the rulers, the authorities, all of these serve to underline the universal sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Wow. Paul says it this way, so that in everything he might have the supremacy so might he might be Lord of all. 
Do you know what the shorthand version of the gospel is? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That was the shorthand version of the gospel for the church. And that's good news. Because if Jesus is the one who by his power, if he is the one who holds all things together, this whole universe is sustained by him. If he is our Lord holding it all together, friend, can he not hold your one life together? Can he not hold you up and sustain us through whatever you might be going through? He's holding the whole world in his power right now. And I don't know what you may be going through today, but your Lord, your Savior, is the one who is sustaining all creation by his power. So, oh friend, don't give up. Don't grow weary. Do not worry about what may come because your Lord is Lord of all. And he's good. He will sustain us. He is our rescuer. He's our redeemer. And he rules over us with his sovereign love and care. Jesus rules the world. I'd love to stay on that for longer, but I want to say more. There's another picture we get. Number four, Jesus reconciles all things. I'd love to keep dwelling on this point as well, but I must be brief here because I, I, if you were with us last week, I touched on the gospel of reconciliation and how Peter the Jew shared the gospel with Cornelius, the Roman Gentile, breaking down the long divides that had existed. And so central to the gospel was and is reconciliation across ethnic and racial difference and social status. And I love what Paul, uh, what, what Scott McKnight, my seminary professor, says about this. This is so good. He says, Paul's mission was not simply to increase the church's members through evangelism, but to get saved Gentiles at the table with saved Jews to form a new family fellowship called the church. Wow. Is that part of your vision of the gospel? It's about eating together, being family as one body, being reconciled by the blood of Jesus into God's family. We're reconciled to one another. And biblical scholar James Dunn, he has an amazing quote on this. He says, The vision is vast. The claim is mind-blowing. It says much for the faith of these first Christians that they should see in Christ's death and resurrection, quite literally, the key to resolving the disharmonies and, uh, of nature and the inhumanities of humankind. And in some ways, still more striking, is the implied vision of the church as the focus and mean, means towards this cosmic reconciliation, the community in which that reconciliation has already taken place or begun to take place, and whose responsibility it is to live out as well as to proclaim its secrets. Now, if you didn't catch all that, what James Dunn is saying is basically this. The church is the sphere and place in which God is reconciling the world. It's where it's already happening, and the church is whispering and saying to the world, hey, do you see all the brokenness around us? Do you see all the divisions around us? We know the secret. We know how to be reconciled. We know how to live in harmony. In fact, we're already living it out. Come join. Come eat at the table with us through Jesus Christ. Does your gospel include this reconciliation with, with others? Does it include a vision of every tribe, tongue, and nation eating together at one table? Because that's the vision of Jesus' gospel. And finally, the last image I want us to focus on today is that Jesus renews us to be his holy people. He renews us. Paul continues this magnificent uh, gospel message in verse 21. Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. Once you were kind of this person, you were hostile to God like an, any, like an enemy because you were inclined to evil. Now he has made you holy, his holy people. It's like you've been totally renewed. It's like you've been reborn. As Jesus liked to say, he said to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You must be remade, renewed into a whole new kind of person. 
And that's what Paul meant in verse 12 when he said he's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. And if we share in the inheritance, that means we are God's children. That, we, that means we've been born into his family. And perhaps you've grown up in the church and some of these phrases don't resonate with you. Uh, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior since you were one of these little ones here coming up front. You've always known about Jesus. Uh, and friends, I want to say to you that you're still made new. You are still born again. You don't have to have one of these uh, from darkness to light stories for this to be true. You are just as loved. You are just as redeemed. You are just as rescued as anybody else. Friends, I have no memory of being born. Is that a surprise to you? I have no memory of being born. I cannot remember it. But I am here. I am alive. I have breath. I'm talking to you right now. And the same is true in the spiritual life. You may not remember a moment. You may not have a time you can point to. But, oh, friend, you are here. And you love Jesus. And you love the church. And you obey his word. You want, you want to follow him as your Lord. Friends, that is the proof. You are a child of God. That you are born again. You are made new by Jesus Christ. So friends, let me summarize this glorious gospel. Through Jesus, we are rescued out of darkness into his church. We are redeemed out of our slavery to sin. We are ruled by creation's true Lord. We are reconciled to God and all people. And we are reborn as his holy people. Now, some of you may have caught on that I really find a lot of joy in finding alliterations when I preach. <laughs> and maybe that's because as a youth pastor, I don't know where that comes from. But we are rescued. We are redeemed. Ruled reconciled, reborn, remade through Jesus. One more R word. We are rooted together in this gospel. We are rooted together in this gospel. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out to you in the gospel. So I just want to ask as I close this morning, how can we be deeply rooted in this gospel together? And I simply just want to say it this way. We must be faithful to the gospel in our beliefs and with our lives, with our thinking and with our actions, with our doctrine, with our practice, with our orthodoxy, with our orthopraxy. You know, Paul's writing this letter because he is concerned that the church will not remain true to the gospel. In fact, he's seen it before. And he's saying, no, th this matters. Unity does not mean pluralism. It means deeper roots in the truth of Jesus Christ. And so the church needs to keep believing and proclaiming the uniqueness of Jesus overall. He's not just Lord of one tiny little part of the world. He is the Lord of all, of all things. He's the goal of this whole creation. And so we need to keep proclaiming. We are rescued by Jesus Christ alone. We are redeemed out of sin's power only by Christ. We are ruled. He is the ruler of all things. Only Jesus is. We are reconciled only by him. And we are made new only by his power. And friends, we need to proclaim that, but also live like we believe that. So let me ask you if, just a few questions based on those great R words to see if we live like we say what we believe. Friend, do you look for opportunities to share Jesus because you really believe he is people's rescue? Do you seek to overcome sin because we know Christ has redeemed us? Does Jesus being your Lord make any practical difference over your life and what you do with your time or your money? Does your vision of the gospel include building friendships at the table? And are you reconciled to your brothers and sisters in Christ? And as God's holy people, do you seek to live a life of holiness dedicated to the Lord? May the Holy Spirit guide you in what he wants to apply to your life today. But friends, Let's be faithful to the gospel in our doctrine together. Let's be faithful to the gospel with our lives together. So may we send our roots down deep into these truths. May we lock arms with each other and stay faithful and to say, no, we're not going to be moved an inch from the hope of the gospel and the hope that we have in Christ. And we're going to do it because we're locked in arms together. Our roots are connected. And we are confident that he who holds the whole universe together by his power can keep holding us together until he comes again. Amen? Amen? Let's pray.